Thank you very much and a very good afternoon to you. Well, time to focus in on a lady who made history on Freedom Day last week. Kirsten Nashafa made sailing history by becoming the first woman's winner of the Golden Globe race. And first South African to win a round-the-world yacht race. She did it solo and with no GPS assistance, breaking records and making international headlines along the way. I chatted to her this afternoon from France where she's been inundated with media requests. She is the lady of the moment, Kirsten Nashafa, a South African woman who has made history and has not only flown the South African flag, but she has flown the flag for women in sailing and she's made global headlines. She chats, she chats to us now on Newsroom Africa once again. Good to finally see your face. It's just been a whirlwind since you actually landed, hasn't it? Yes, it certainly has. Uh, certainly has been a whirlwind, uh, but a good whirlwind. Uh, Lots of enthusiasm, uh, very, very warm welcome, uh, you know, seeing people again after eight months, uh, talking to people, seeing family, seeing friends, pretty amazing. Could you imagine the kind of reception that you got? Had you any idea? Um, I didn't have any idea. And to be honest, I wasn't really thinking that much of the arrival. Uh, at the, you know, the last couple of weeks, I was pushing the boat as hard as I could because I realized that things were on the edge and it was kind of now or never if I wanted to win. Um, so all I was doing was concentrating on uh, sailing the boat um, and trying not to think about the arrival. Uh, but I didn't imagine uh, the reception I got and I didn't know that I, but when I arrived or I, when I started drifting seven miles uh, outside of port just before the finish line, uh, at that point I didn't know yet that I, I had won. So um, yeah, lots of excitement and good things when I finally found out. When you and I spoke, you were in a very difficult position. You were stuck in the doldrums and you had been for a long period of time. You were telling me how you would, your day would consist of getting up, trying to check if there was wind, jumping off of the boat, going for a swim, rubbing off barnacles and then jumping back inside and, and trying just to get away from the heat. Can you tell us how difficult that period was and just the last kind of two months um, at sea? How difficult have that, has that been in comparison to the rest of the journey? Yeah, well, certainly I think uh, for me, the most difficult peri periods of the whole race were the calms. Because if you're in a storm, you can, you know, there's adrenaline, there's stuff you have to do, there are things you can do to, uh, you know, storm tactics to keep your boat safe, to keep yourself sta safe. Um, but when you're in the calms, there's nothing you can do. You can try and uh, sail on squall clouds, which is very... Uh, um, tiring because you get 10 minutes of wind, then it disappears. It comes from all sorts of dif different directions. Uh, the sails going up, the sails going down, the sails are slamming when there's no wind. Um, it's tiring, it's inconsistent, it's slow. Um, and, you know, especially in a race when you know that you're stuck and there's nothing you can do about it and you know that the other competitors are gaining on you, overtaking you, all that, um, it's, uh, it's very demoralizing, shall I say. So you have to just try and Stay positive every time your thoughts start, uh, you know, going in a negative kind of way. You just have to say, stop it. Uh, enjoy the sunset. Have a swim. Uh, every now and again, a dolphin would come past. That would always really, really cheer me up. Um, and then when I did finally get out of the doldrums, which was, um, I think maybe even the next day after having spoke to you, I, I remember you phoned and I was in, I'd just been hit by a massive line squall. And that's often uh, the end of the doldrums. That's often how the, uh, Southeasters will change over into the northeaster trades or uh, vice versa. And after that, the wind actually started coming through. It was slow and it was little, but I started moving. And uh, the moment you're moving, well, the moment I'm moving, I, I feel better. I feel more positive. The wind got better and better, uh, and I started really enjoying the sail again. And then I thought, well, I don't know where I am. I'm sure I'm behind everyone else by now, but just enjoy it because soon it's going to be over. The last few weeks uh, leading up to, you know, the arrival, were some of the most exciting weeks because I was really pushing the boat hard. I was really in racing mode. Uh, I could afford to be a little less conservative. Where does this mental fortitude come from? You've been on the ocean for 235 days, all on your own, navigating via the stars. You once upon a time cycled from Europe to the bottom of Africa. Where does this mental fortitude that you have come from? I don't know. I guess I've been doing it for such a long time. It's, it's uh I've, I kind of started doing things like that at the age of 18 and every time I had an idea about doing a trip and I was encountering uh, difficulties, 
I just say just push on through, just push on through, get to the next milestone. And, um, you know, sometimes people say, but it must have been so incredibly difficult. But, you know, I, I felt really good out at sea. I enjoyed my boat. I felt safe on my boat. Uh, um, I always feel good when I'm in nature. I think I derive a lot of my mental fortitude, if you want to call that, out of being in nature. I take a lot of uh, comfort and consolation. Uh, you know, out of small things, like I was saying, the, the dolphins would comfort me and the doldrums, little things like that. And um, and I think one of the most important things is just taking things one step at a time and, and, and setting little milestones for yourself and just doing little steps rather than always uh, looking at the entirety of the trip and, and envisaging the end. How do you navigate by the stars? Well, you can nav- navigate by the stars or the sun or the moon. The stars are a little bit more difficult because you've got a very uh, narrow time gap during twilight that you can use the stars because the thing is you need to be able to see the horizon. And the whole idea is that you take an angle with your sextant, you measure an angle between the horizon and the celestial body that you're observing. And based on that angle and based on having your very exact time, uh, you can then calculate what your position is uh, all based on spherical trigonometry, but there there is a nautical element in Mac that's got everything pre-calculated, so you can just look up the information. Um, so you can use the stars, you can use planets, uh, and you can use the sun, which is the easiest. Um, so uh, a lot of your routine out of sea when you're navigating uh, by sextant is based on the best times to take um, sights. And I used to take a morning sight, and a uh, noon sight because that gives you a pretty accurate uh, longitude in the mornings and the latitude in the afternoons and um, or at noon. And, uh, yeah, and then uh, I didn't really need to use the stars a lot. Uh, often it's difficult because the clouds uh, pulling in overnight and it's, it's more difficult to actually find the stars on your sextant. Can you tell us about the uh, saving of uh, Tapio Lettinen uh, and how that all happened? A man was sitting in a life in a life road, a life raft for almost 24 hours, and you got to him. You managed to save him uh, and assist him. But it's when when you read about it, it seems incredibly dramatic. What was it like? So what happened is uh, I got a message via YB3 tracker because that was the only device that was on 24/7 that. Uh, you know, they could always contact us on for emergencies or, you know, massive storm warnings or anything like that. And I got the, I got three messages in one go. The first message was saying that he's just tree speaking that's been deployed. Uh, And then there was another message uh, saying that his boat had sunk. And then there was a third message saying that he was safe in the life raft um, at that point in time. But because I received three messages in one go, I knew that I'd received them delayed. Um, and that, of course, upset me because I was also aware that I was probably the person most uh, who was closest to him at the time. So the first thing I did was uh, get onto the satellite phone and phone uh, race control and say, what has happened and where is he and can I help? And they said, yes, you're the closest boat to him. Can you get to him as quickly as possible? And from that moment on, I was just in functional mode, uh, which meant getting to him as quickly as possible. That meant using as much sail as possible. Uh, using the engine if needed be, and staying at the helm. I stayed awake all night on the helm to try and, uh, you know, steer the most accurate and the quickest course possible. And the one good thing was that he was a, he is an incredibly positive person. So even in his messages, his third message was saying, I'm safe. I've saluted my boat that has sunk, uh, and, and everything's okay. And, and that reassured me that he's not sitting in an absolute state of panic. But that didn't slow me down at all. Um, and then towards uh, sunrise, uh, I started getting quite close to him. And eventually I heard him calling me on the VHF radio saying that he could see me. And I could hear uh, in his voice that he was really eager for me to um, to arrive, which is obviously understandable. But the problem was he could see me, he could see my sails and the rig. I couldn't see him because it's incredibly difficult and you don't really know how difficult it is until you've experienced it, but it's very difficult to spot a little life raft uh, in a big swell because uh, it's a small little thing. Even though it's bright orange, you just don't see it. So he kept on saying, yeah, I can see you, I can see you. And I'm like, I, I can really only see your position um, that I'm, I'm trying to hold the right course to get to you. But um, I knew he was very eager for me to get there. And then he was, of course, prepared. He'd been waiting all night for my arrival. So on the first passage past him, he already threw me a line. I caught the line. 
I tied the line off on my boat and then we pulled his raft alongside my boat. We got him on board. I gave him a big hug. I was super relieved. He was super relieved. And then we had a little, uh, a little rum together just to celebrate the fact that he was <laughs> alive and safe and, 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 you know, just to, to calm the nerves a little bit perhaps. But, um, and, and while all this was happening, the cargo ship that had been diverted by the MRCC was also approaching. And, uh, we then spoke to them on VHF radio. Uh, to just decide how we were going to transfer him from my boat onto the ship. Um, and the ship initially said, you know, come alongside uh, and he can climb up the ladder. And it's like, <laughs> that's not going to work because that's going to destroy my rig. I can't come alongside. But what we then decided on together was I would come as close as I safely could and they would throw as long a line as they could, as far as they could. Uh, and we, we didn't think it would actually drop on the deck, but I managed to get close enough that they could throw their line onto the deck. Tapio caught the line. Uh, we then tied that line onto his life raft, and he climbed back into his life raft. I then cut the, the lashing on my side, released his life raft, and let myself drift away uh, from the cargo ship. And they pulled him uh, right up to you know where the ladder was, and he then had to climb the long way up the ladder. And after he climbed up the ladder, they then also still retrieved the life raft. So there was no um, leaving any plastic around to float in the sea. Uh, and then, and then it was okay. He's safe. He's on board. Um, we had a bit of a debrief myself and the ship's captain. They were an uh, Indian crew, fantastic people to work with, very professional, very competent. Um, and I thanked them for their, you know, their competence. And they, and they said uh, that they were pleased that I, I was there because they said, to try and get close to Tapio in a uh, life raft uh, with a massive cargo ship like that would have been pretty difficult for them. So I was just glad that I I was able to help. Do you pay any attention to the amount of records that you broke and the kind of history that you've made for women in sport, women in sailing, South African sailing? Um, I haven't, to be honest, paid that much attention to it uh, yet. Uh, but I, I do have to say I was incredibly proud um, within those last seven miles and uh, actually finally sailing, or shall I say drifting over the finish line, <laughs> to be able to to be able to wave the South African flag. And what made it even more special was this amazing coincidence that it just happened to be on Freedom Day as well. So I was uh, I was very uh, I was very proud in that moment to be able to represent um, my country. Person, thank you very much and do enjoy all of the celebrations in your honour in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vail, and I shall certainly do so.